Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's January 16th, 2020, and we could not be more excited uh, for the new year and to be uh, recording a new season, we can even say, of Mormon Stories Podcast interviews. Um, I, we are broadcasting to you today uh, live from the Mormon, the new Mormon Stories Podcast slash Thrive Studios um, here in Holiday, Utah. Um, and uh, if you look at the wide shot, you can actually see, uh, for those who are watching via Facebook or YouTube, kind of this new setup. Uh, we have partnered with my dear friend uh, Clint uh, Martin and his wife Jenny um, to co-locate a new facility um, of the Mormon Stories Podcast Studios uh, with what we're calling the Thrive Center, which is just a community center for progressive and post-Mormons who are uh, looking to learn and grow and find community and build together. So um, we've got this slick new podcast studio that I've teamed with uh, Cody Layton and Tyler Alden to to build out. It's got a bit of a Joe Rogan-esque feel to it. Um, and we're going to be doing lots of cool things here in the studio We've got brand new mics, uh, lighting. It's super exciting, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, one thing about that is that I'm really excited. Uh, I follow a couple podcasts. One is called Armchair Expert. Another one is um, uh, the, the Conan O'Brien podcast. But in, in a lot of podcasts going on these days, the, what they do is they have their producer um, uh, with his own microphone. And so – the person who's producing the podcast episode can monitor comments, chime in if there's an error or if there's a need for some sort of correction or if, if I forgot to ask a really important question, the producer can jump in and say or do anything they need to, and they've got their own mic. So um, we're really fortunate to have with us uh, uh, helping out with the Open Stories Foundation, Tyler Alden. Tyler, you can wave to everybody if you want. <laughs> Glad to be here with you today, John. Tyler's, Tyler's our producer. Tyler, it's nice to, nice to have you with us. Well, thanks for having me. It's yeah. Do you want to say anything? to Do you want to introduce yourself to our listeners just for a second? I'm Tyler Alden, and I'm uh, <laughs> helping out here today with the cameras and really just excited about our guest. And Tyler's, well, it's good to have you, Tyler. Thanks for all you've done to make this studio possible, along with Cody and Clint. Um, and... One of the things we want to do, we want to we want to try to live stream these when we can. But uh, if I'm paying attention to to viewer comments, it kind of takes me out of the interview, and I don't want that to happen. So Tyler will monitor your comments and questions. He'll uh, jump in at at graceful periods and either make the comments or ask the questions. Um, and so we're looking forward to that, and and I'll be able to focus more on my my guest. Does that sound all right, Tyler? Sounds great to me. All right. I'll be as graceful as I can. <laughs> I know you will. Um, just really quickly, just a tiny bit more about the studio. So uh, the Thrive Center here uh, in Holiday, Utah, is exciting for a couple of reasons. Um, we've been holding these Thrive uh, support groups all around the country. There's more than 50 of them. And uh, once a month, there's been this uh, faith crisis support group. Um, that uh, are, is being held in local areas. Uh, and that's been really successful because people in a faith crisis really need support and friends and community. And then we've added to that this idea once a month of sort of a secular Sunday school where on a su one Sunday each month, people in the area get together and they have a potluck and they talk about an interesting topic that's more focused on growth than on healing and, and faith crisis stuff. And so... We've picked uh, a book for our first few months. It's called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And um, in Thrive uh, support groups all around the country, they'll be um, having their first what we call growth meeting this Sunday. It's going to be usually the third Sunday of every month. And uh, people just show up around 10 a.m. or whatever time the group decides, bring a potluck, talk about this book. Um, talk about a given topic, whether it's honesty or parenting or healthy relationships or healthy marriage, um, and then eat and, and uh, build community. So that's going to be happening this Sunday. 
here in Holiday, we're going to be doing that the following Sunday. So it's basically two Sundays from now. But the reason why I'm mentioning all that is because we really want this center in Holiday, along with the center that's already in Springville, to be a gathering place for post-Mormons and progressive Mormons and liberal Mormons. Um, we want to be able to have book signings here. We want to be able to have live podcasts. We want to be able to have workshops and retreats. And incidentally, we're so excited that Natasha Elfer Parker, marriage and family therapist, sex therapist, has uh, relocated to Utah. And now her her, um, her private practice, along with Symmetry Solutions, is co-located here at this Thrive Center in Holiday. So you can come visit her if you need any counseling or therapy, but also for the next two months, she's holding a a weekly workshop on various issues related to faith crisis, whether it's communicating with believing family or friends or navigating your marriage or raising kids or whatever it is. So if you want to come here uh, each Wednesday night at 7 p.m., you can take part of that. It's free. And we plan to be doing um, retreats and uh, and other events here too. And I'll just say that um, we plan to have our new first son of Mormon stories retreat. We're going to start doing those again. It's kind of a faith crisis retreat, and we're going to hope to do that the last weekend in February. So stay tuned for more about that. Um, but we're just super excited for all the new changes. We're grateful for all the donors and, and volunteers who've helped make this possible. And, uh, we, we hope, uh, to do lots of good things for post Mormons and progressive Mormons in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Tyler, did I forget anything? I think you hit it all. Okay. Housekeeping. All right. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Lila Tuller. Um, Lila may be a name, her, her name may be familiar to a few of you because um, she was interviewed recently on Radio Free Mormon uh, podcast. That's not where I learned about Lila. Um, in one of the free workshops that we held last year at the Community of Christ, I met Lila for the first time. Um, I was really excited to meet her to hear about her story. I've been uh, contacted either by or about her brother, um, you know, in the past few years as well. And so I've known about uh, Lila and her family for a while. Um, and and again, I'm I'm super happy that Radio Free Mormon was able to interview Lila along with uh, Bill Real, I think. <clears throat> but I've been wanting to interview Lila for some time, and I'm really excited to be able to interview her today. For those of you who don't know, uh, Lila Tuller is the uh, child of um, uh, the late Mormon uh, General Authority Hartman Rector Jr. and you know his wife, her mother. So those of you who who were uh, you know teen or adult Mormons in the 70s or 80s or even 90s will have heard the name Hartman Rector Jr. He didn't reach the level of apostle, but he certainly uh, was among the most prominent non-apostle general authorities in the church. I'm pretty sure he served in the Quorum of the Seventy, but also in the presidency of the Seventy for many years. Um, and uh, so we're going to be talking about a lot today. We're going to be talking about a little bit about um, Lila's parents' story, Something that's interesting is that her dad was a convert uh, to Mormonism. And so, you know, back then there weren't many converts that became general authorities. So we're going to talk about uh, her parents' story. We're going to talk about what it was like for her growing up in the home of a Mormon general authority. Uh, you know, which which apostles did she meet? How strict were her parents? What's what's it like on the inside? What, can she, what insight can she provide into whether – Mormon general authorities really believe or don't, which is one of the big questions people ask. Was he a special witness? Did he get a second anointing? Um, you know, was he was he loving? Could he? Did he have special powers to heal? Like all these things that you would wonder uh, about what it's like to be the child of a general authority. Was he gone all the time? Did the family secretly fight? Like all these sort of things were there dirty little secrets? And we're not you know, seeking for smut, but I mean, like, were there secrets in the family that was there a lot of pressure? Was it super intense? Like, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of dive into that kind of stuff. Um, and just kind of about what it's like to, to be a general authority from the, the child's perspective, um, and the child of a general authority from the child's perspective. And then we'll talk about Lila's own faith journey. Um, she, she has had a crisis of faith at some point. And, uh, so we'll talk about that. She's had her own, uh, you know, 
family and marriage and children and we'll just talk about all that. And then in the end, we'll end with sort of like how how Lila has uh, kind of healed and grown in her uh, journey, especially after her faith crisis. And we'll start uh, – we'll follow some of these questions that I've been putting out about kind of with the Thrive theme about, uh, you know, questions focused on healing and growth after Mormonism. So that's what – it's going to be a longer Mormon Stories interview, probably three, four, five hours. So buckle in. Um, but we're going to cover a lot of great territory in the same tradition of the Christine Jepson Clark interview on Mormon Stories where we interviewed her, the daughter of Malcolm Jepson, who was – uh, Boyd K. Packer's best friend and doctor and also the general authority who's responsible for um, excommunicating many of the people in the September 6th. That's actually the one of, if not the most downloaded Mormon Stories episodes of all time. Um, we've also interviewed, I think, uh, M. Russell Ballard's granddaughter. And uh, so whenever we can get family members of general authorities, we like to do that. So thanks for tuning in. Lila, uh, you were very patient in that very lengthy introduction. Is there anything you want to correct or add or take away from? Oh, no. You did great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, so let's begin. I, I, I guess the place to begin would be with your parents' story, unless there's some opening statement you want to make about your intentions or, you know, anything no. like that. No, I'm... I think you did great. We can start wherever you want to start um, with my parents' story. Uh, so just real briefly, I don't want to be, be, uh, belabor anything, but my parents were not members of the church. They both grew up in Missouri, um, and they met each other in Missouri. My mother was 14. My dad was 18 when they first met, and the story he tells, or always told, was that he saw her walking down the sidewalk this beautiful black-haired girl, and went up to her and said, my name's Hartman Rector Jr. Um, I'm going to marry you in four years. I'm going away to the Navy. And when I come back, I'm going to marry you. And she looked at him and said, okay. <laughs> That's kind of the way they tell the story. It was love at first sight. Um, and he did go away for four years in the Navy and came back, and they did get married. And they were part of kind of society uh, in Missouri at the time. You know, they they did the parties and they drank and they smoked. And my mom had a cute little gold cigarette box that she kept her cigarettes in. And, um, you know, they, they were just typical, normal people of the time. And uh, fast forward to getting, they got married. They had, um, they were, had, she was pregnant with her third child. Let me just say, let me just ask oh, yeah. real quickly. So, he was a pilot, right? Right. For the Navy. Right. That's kind of a big deal, a Navy pilot. Yeah, yeah. Did he serve in World War II? Did he serve in Vietnam? Do you even know? It was the Korean War. Korean he War. So between he in. World War II and right. And did he like fly overseas? Yeah. Was he a bomber? Was he mm -hmm. a jet fight jet a pilot fighter pilot? Like, yeah. Do you know, he was a bomber. <laughs> so he, you know, he was on the the aircraft carriers out in the ocean. And would take off, off the aircraft carrier and land on the aircraft carrier. And he was he was bombing, um, over in Korea. That he talked about dropping bombs. You know, they'd give him a, a point on the map and tell him to wipe it out. And so he would do that. Um, usually, they were not s places where there were civilians. He was just bombing. You know, the trains and and the you know different military outposts. But he wasn't really trying to kill anyone this is what he said um and he yeah it was a, it was uh he was a captain so he you know he was he was up there he was proud of his naval service did you get a sense for um was he raised lds i mean it's not not was he raised lds was he raised religious at all and um did he ever tell you like how he got converted yeah okay he was oh, not. We haven't gotten there yet. Right. So so all the stuff with your mom happened before he converted. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to there. We'll get to that. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's keep going. So he, he, but what was he raised religious? No, there was, he was not a member of any church. Um, there was a, a family 
big family Bible that his grandmother would read out of to him. But that was the extent of his religious training. Um, there really was no religion. His, my mom was a member of the Methodist faith, but they never went to church. You know, it was just, she just wasn't active. Okay, so not super religious. Mm -hmm. So he serves in the war, then they get married. Right. How, how, does it, how does it go from there? Well, they got married, and while he was out on a boat in Japan uh, doing some accelerated, accelerated training, my mom was home, and she was pregnant with the third child, and the missionaries tracked him, tracked it into her, knocked on her door. She invited the men. Oh, and I have to kind of preface, preface this with my dad had a sort of theme that he lived his life by, and it was um, never cease to grow. That was one of them. That was one theme. And then the other theme was his nightly prayer. And the, my mom would say he did it. Well, it wasn't just nightly. It was every time he prayed, he would say, Dear God, please show me the truth. Please bring me the truth. And that was his, you know, he was searching. He was a searching for truth soul. And uh, so my mom was aware of that. So when the missionaries tracked her out, she invited the men and said, you know, sit down and tell me what, what have you got? What, what are you, what are you teaching? And they left her with some material. Um, and then my dad came home from his trip abroad and she handed him the Book of Mormon, which she had already started to read. And then he, he looked at it and said something like, oh yeah, probably written by a man. I'll shoot it down 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that was his his idea. He had he had looked into a lot of different religions. He, he had been searching for a while for the truth. So when he started, the story goes that when he started reading the Book of Mormon, he wasn't, he said he hadn't finished first Nephi before he, he prayed that it was true. And then when he finished second Nephi, which is the hardest part, um, he said he knew it was true. Hmm. And it was just an overwhelming feeling. And from then on, I mean, they just stopped drinking, smoking, partying. Everything just came to a screeching halt. They changed everything. They just, and were very, you know, he got baptized on the boat, on the ship. Um, actually, they had to dock, and he got baptized in a really cold ocean. I remember him saying he was freezing. And my mom got baptized in San Diego. And uh, then, you know, when he came home, they started going to church in earnest. And so they were baptized separately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And but do you know I, around what year? Oh, gosh. I think it was 51. Okay. Right around then. That's right yeah. at the time of the Korean War, for sure. Right. So this is Eisenhower time. This is like... Right. Exactly. Post-World War, Cold War. Yep. McCarthy hearing Eisenhower, Nixon vice president, that kind of Yeah, you know your era. history. No, no, no. Yeah, I, you do. I like that little part of it. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was the Book of Mormon that converted him. Right. Okay. Um, so they stop their partying lifestyles yeah. and they both get baptized. How does it how does it progress? How many kids were born when they were when they were? Uh, she was pregnant with her third. Okay. And, okay. Um, so and you're, 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 I'm number six. You're six. Okay. So it was a ways before me. Yeah. Um, they just, you know, they started. My dad. They moved to Virginia after the war was over. Um, my dad got a job at the Pentagon in the Department of Agriculture, and he worked with um, Ezra Tapp Ezra Benson. Tapp Benz Benson, who's my cousin. Really? Oh. So wow. so yeah, Ezra Tapp Benson was Secretary of Agriculture. Right. Under Eisenhower. Under Eisenhower. And so your dad got a hookup. He did. Got a Mormon hookup. He got a Mormon hookup. With the, future, <laughs> with the apostle slash future prophet to be. Right. Okay. Right. So I think um, my dad, the personality that my dad has, very, he was very charismatic, uh, outgoing, fun loving, p people person, and and just loved uh, entertaining people and loved a crowd, loved. Um, more people around him, the better. Very much an extrovert. And he, I think he just had an impression on Ezra Taft Benson. And his best friend was Reed Benson, who was the son, the right? son of. The son of Ezra Right. Taft. So they were buddies. And so and my, at the time, my dad was a seminary teacher, you know, and... Um, but not CES. Was he church employment? You know, I don't, you know, okay. I don't okay. know, okay. to be honest. Okay. 
I just know he was a seminary okay. teacher. And uh, so that, so before, I mean, I was little at the time. When he got called, I was seven years old. So my experience with it is kind of vague. I just remember in retrospect kind of, oh, that's what was going on. Okay, now I understand. So he got the call, and which was, we nobody expected that. It was a total, call? the call to be a general authority. Okay, so had he been bishop or stake president? No. Really? No, none of that. How many years had he been a member before he gets called? Any I think idea? I did the math, and I think it was like 16 years okay. or something. I wonder never why he was never a bishop or stake president or any of that. He was a stake mission leader. Yeah. Um, no, and he had been a... Uh, and he'd never been a mission president before. No, no. That I mean, maybe that's how they did it back then. Well, I just think he, you know, he didn't have the, the pedigree at all. He, it was just somebody said, hey, this guy's on fire. He'd be great, a great missionary um, advocate, you know. And, and so they, I don't know, he got the call. And, you know, pretty quick he got sent on to be a mission president right away to mm. uh, Tallahassee, Florida. So when I was in fifth grade, that's where I lived for just for a year. He went to Tallahassee. Okay, so he gets called as a general authority first. Right. Then as a mission president. Yeah. So we moved to Salt Lake and then almost, well, I spent one year and uh, two years in Salt Lake. And then he gets called to be a mission president. And it must have been as to have Benson. I mean, just guessing, I'm speculating, but it's like, hey, this guy's sharp. Yeah. Let's get him. Let's get him in the leadership ranks. Yeah. And we need to give him some leadership experience. So let's make him a mission president. I guess. Yeah. Because yeah. he was. I mean, he was a missionary entrepreneur. Like he he was converting everybody, everybody, our neighbors, everybody he could. He was just a, had the missionary spirit. So I think they saw that and they're like, yeah, get him going. Let's get him in there. So went to Tallahassee. Um, he was on fire down there, uh, loved it. And, I mean, just a little side note, my sister, one of my sisters, who I won't mention, got pregnant at 17 while we were in Florida. Oh, no. Yeah. So with by an LDS kid in the ward. <laughs> so that was a real upsetting thing for my dad. I remember wa watching him. I didn't know what was going on. All I knew is that my dad was crying, walking around the house, sobbing, yelling, just furious, furious at, at the position he was in, you know, as the mission president and his daughter's knocked up. <laughs> so, and, and like I said, I was nine years old. I really like, I didn't know what was happening. I just knew my dad was really upset. So, and then the next thing I knew, my sister, I saw her uh, like, and we shared a bathroom, and I noticed she was pregnant. And then and she said, yes, I'm pregnant. And the next thing I knew, she was shipped off to Georgia to have the baby. What does that mean? They found a place for her to live, so she wasn't there being pregnant. Isn't that interesting? It's like... Yeah, get her out of here. Was it a family secret? Oh, yeah. It was totally a family secret. Like, I was I was sworn to secrecy. I wasn't supposed to talk about it so to the anybody. Ward, so, in theory, the ward didn't know. In theory, yeah. She was, like, probably five months along when they sent her out. So she was starting to show. But they got her out of there, and then my dad insisted that they get married. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. They were getting married. I mean, and they had no choice. And, again, do you have a sense for what year this is? Okay, let's see. Uh, this would have been around 71. Okay, so this is like 72. the year, the, kind of the year the Beatles are breaking up. This oh, is Woodstock. Yeah. yeah. This kind of Woodstock, you know, is emerging, the hippie culture. The very hippie culture. Your sister, your sister was how old? She was 17. And you were how old? I was 10. Okay, you were young. Yeah. You were young. And what an embarrassment. And this is after you've been called as a general right. authority. Right, after he was called as general wow. authority, mission president. Okay, and mission president. Yeah. So she, okay. And that's just that culture of like shipping them off. Right. Like when does a kid Shame. need, when does a kid need more help than when they're pregnant, pregnant. or sick or whatever? And yeah. not only are they not getting the help they need. Right. From their parents. Right. But they're, like you said, they're shipped off as if it's some shameful, yeah. awful thing. Yeah. And it's all hidden. Right. So and not talked about. Open, instead of being open and honest, it's kind of hidden and. And that must have been terribly embarrassing for your parents to have to go tell 
whoever their upline general authorities oh were. Oh, my gosh. I don't know that they a, did tell. I don't know. Maybe they, they, may have, maybe they kept it secret. We don't know. I don't know. But I just know that, you know, the next thing I knew, she was married. Um, and then she had the baby. And then, you know, later, a year later, they got sealed in the temple. I mean, with my dad just breathing down their neck. So um, she got pulled out of uh, high school, didn't finish because she was pregnant, you know. And so it was all kind of mm. wild. But yeah. uh, so, We can talk about your sister later, but did that, yeah. did, was that traumatic for her? Very. Had she had scars about that since? Oh, yeah. It was an abusive relationship, too. And she ended up having six kids with, that, with him, and then they ended up divorcing Oh, was so another. he wasn't good for her, but since you're, it was a shotgun wedding, right? your dad, your parents insisted on it. I, absolutely. Yeah. That was the only <coughs> way out for them. They didn't, you know, you're going to make this right. Uh, okay. So then, let me think. Then, um, Lila, if I may interject, yeah. someone asked, was the baby put up for adoption? No. Nope. They kept the baby. Um, and he is currently still living in Florida. Most of the kids do that they had. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Oh, one other. Well, and thanks, listener. <laughs> yeah. There's other details. I think there's certain things I should probably not say because they're family things. But um, yeah, my, I, I, you could write a probably do a, a movie and a book about the intrigue of my family <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> well, that's why we're doing a podcast. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> oh well, my heart's breaking for your sister. Yeah. Because. It was rough for her. Who wants to be shamed about their mistake? And then who wants to be daddy, mommy's little secret? Right. Who wants to be forced into a marriage that may not be right? Right. And then what about just the generational ripple effects of yeah. being in an abusive marriage that's that's harmful and painful and how that af affects all the children? Like all of them, What yeah. a domino of, of potential catastrophes. Exactly. All in a family that's probably highlighted as this ideal yeah. elite Mormon family. Aren't they perfect? And you always wonder that, and we'll get into this, obviously, just are, are these perfect Mormon families really perfect? And you kind of know they're not. But, right. But For some reason, we kind of like to idolize them, and even though we know they can't possibly be perfect. Living up to it all. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so she ended up staying in Florida. My family went back to Salt Lake, and we didn't see her for years and years. She just was stuck out there in Florida. My dad continued, you know, onward and upward, but we didn't go back to Florida, and she didn't come out. So I didn't see her for a long time. Now, I wonder if they just wanted the kids to get old enough so that no one would ask questions. Like, why would she be estranged, effectively estranged from the family for years? I think it was such a an embarrassment for my dad. I just think he was absolutely mortified by it. And, you know, here he is new. You know, he's the <laughs> new guy on the block, and immediately— this happens. Um, I yeah, I think it was just so embarrassing for him. They stayed in touch, but you know, there was a lot of abuse going on that she never mentioned because she just thought I can't complain. I have no right to complain because because I, I screwed I, up. I, I screwed up exactly. Uh, we talked about this with Sean from from Wales yesterday. She had a teenage pregnancy. We had another uh, interview on Mama Stories just yesterday and. Just the shame. Was it on? Was it live yesterday? Yeah, it was I live streamed. That. Yeah, it's it's good. I Listeners, go if you haven't that. checked that out yet, check out the one about uh, Sean from uh, from Wales. It's it's fascinating, wow. but yeah, so much shame and then so many ripple effects. But anyway, so you guys moved to Salt Lake, right? What 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 area? We lived uh, after we came back. Well, before Florida, we lived over on the East Bench near. Um, Skyline High School Kind of Mill area. Creek? Mill yes, Creek? East Mill Creek. That's where that's where Christine Jepson Clark's family lived, Malcolm Jepson. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like up in that area with mm -hmm. streets named like Moroni and right. Hiram and <laughs> right. all these streets named after Book of Mormon characters. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same area, but. Similar. I know where those yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. We're close. Okay. It's the same general area. Okay. And then when we came back from Florida, we moved to the avenues. Oh. The upper avenues, 18th Avenue and up into a, my, a house that. My dad found on foreclosure there had been satanic rituals taking place in that house. They had their signs painted on the walls. There was burnt crosses in the backyard. It was this it was filthy. It was it was this big beautiful home, but it had been completely um, ransacked by a satanic group that would meet there. 
So we moved in, and my dad, the first thing he did was dedicate the house. And he had to rededicate it several times because we had experiences with what we thought were evil spirits in the house. Okay, so this is mid-70s now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Bruce R. McConkie's book would have been out, which right. would have talked Long about doctrine. Ouija boards and evil mm -hmm. spirits. And, and this would have been around the time that the movie The Omen was coming out in the 70s. Right. Damien and, all and those, Satan. Yes. So there, the '70s started to rage, and all, all this Rosemary's rock music, baby. Ozzy Osbourne, yep. and like Led Zeppelin, and all these this hype and hysteria around Satan Black and Satanism. Magic. Yeah. And so, uh, and so that stuff would have been happening, but that shows if your dad would have taken the time. Like the biggest question I get, bar none, is do general authorities really believe? And I guess it's different in the 70s than now. Yeah. But even back then, there was stuff going on with, like, Leonard Arrington or, you know, uh, church history and stuff. But they always want to ask, you know, do the general authorities really believe? Yeah. And I just can't imagine your dad doing an ex performing an exorcism to clean out the evil spirits yeah. if he didn't really believe. My dad was a believer. Absolutely. <laughs> because think about it. If he was a new convert. The, the missionaries did not tell him the deep, dark secrets of anything. They, they just gave him the, the discussions, right? So it was he, my dad joined the church believing that it was, you know, this wonderful, glorious, amazing, happy thing that, that you know, was, why, wouldn't, why would anyone not want to join the church? That was his philosophy. It was like, hey, you're crazy if you don't join this church. It's amazing. Like it's, it answers all my questions. It's, this, it's so neatly tied up in a bow. To him, it was perfect. So he didn't know. I don't think he knew any of this stuff, I, the history. So I didn't ask you that. Later. Like Joseph oh. is a polygamist or like Book of Abraham or. Not yet. He's, okay. He did Book, get. Okay. Okay. But, but, it, but at the time he was a general authority and right. didn't know. No. That's another question. Do the general authorities know? At least we can say in the 70s, there were there at least was a time where I general authorities there didn't were know. many that didn't yeah, know. Yeah, didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. yeah I, I think they kind of found out, you know, when things started breaking, I don't know, during the Hoffman years, you know. some. We'll stuff. get to that, right? Okay, Was yeah. your dad involved with the Hoffman stuff? A little bit, yeah. Okay, we'll get, we'll get to that. Okay. Let's not forget okay. to talk about that. Okay, so he, he performs an exorcism on your house, yeah. casts out the evil <laughs> spirits, yeah. and you move into the avenues. Is that like East High School mm -hmm. back in I the went day? To East, yep. So what was that like, moving to the, you know, Oz, basically? <laughs> it was great. Um, it, was, it was hard because I moved in um, in junior high. I was sixth grade, I think. So, you know, you have to kind of make friends and try to fit in to group what that's already established. Right. And, um, and, it, but it was, I loved it. I loved East High. I loved my, um, my years there. My brother, Dan, who was five years older than me, was the big man on campus. He was so, he was popular. Everybody knew him. So as his little sister, I kind of had it in, you know, I, I'm Dan's little sister. So everybody's like, oh yeah, you're cool then, you know? Dan was this big skier, and he was, um, he just had all the girls. He had the guys. He was just a, you know, a really popular kid. And so, um, yeah, we kind of moved into this rich neighborhood. My parents were not wealthy at all. We came from kind of, you know, I would just say blue collar, not very, we didn't have a lot, middle class into an upper class neighborhood and everybody was, you know, had boats and, and uh, cabins and, you know, all kinds of toys. And um, I didn't, I had never had any of that growing up. So your dad would have been a general authority, so he would have been on salary. Right. But you probably don't know what that amount I don't know was. the amount. I want to say at the time. And in the 70s, we'd have to adjust for inflation, right? right. Adjust back for inflation. Right. So at the t this is what I was told by my parents. They said, you know, we get some money, but it's not a lot. So, you know, we're going to shop thrift stores and we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to try to make do and we're going to write books. And that's how we make extra money is by writing books. <laughs> what? That's what they were kind of told. Hey, if you want to make some money, write a book. <laughs> okay. So immediately, you know, my mom's like, okay, I'm a writer now. And, and she would say to the kids, she'd say, okay, you guys. I'm going to be gone for about four hours. i got to go write the, on the book, work on the book. You guys just take care of yourselves. Don't answer the door or the phone. I'll just be in there for a while. My dad was never home, so 
you know, we were like, cool, <laughs> we can do whatever we want for four hours. Mom's going to be in the do- in the room writing a book. And she was always writing a book huh. forever. She wrote, you know, they wrote No More Strangers. But my mom wrote like four other books after the No More Strangers volumes, all four of them. Then she started writing her own books. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, let's two things. Uh, to what extent was your family doing, you know, Morning and evening prayer, Mm. scripture study, daily scripture study, family home evening, like how orthodox was the actual household? Okay. It was, we did, when my dad was in town, which was rare, he always made us. Wait, so he was gone, let's just say four weeks out of, four weeks out of the year, out of the month, how many days would he be gone? Uh, Okay. Well, it probably There was the traveling... They did these. They did these trips, which were a month long, at least a month long, sometimes six weeks, and that was every. So they'd be home for three, gone for a month. Home for three, gone for a month, and that was that was just the regular routine. And my mom would go with my dad. Home for three weeks. Home for three months, gone for a month. Okay, got it, got it. So, they were home. You know, they were gone for long periods of time, like for a whole month. So yeah, my parents, imagine your dad not being around for a month. Yeah. Well, my mom, too. They'd oh, go she would together. go with them. What? Yeah. So we got farmed out. Like, I'd go one one month, I'd be, or, you know, one time they'd travel, I'd be over at my girlfriend's house, you know, and I'd stay there for a month. My brother would go to his friend's house. The next time, my mom would send me over here because we don't want to wear out the welcome over here. So she'd send me over there and my brother over here, my little sister over here. <laughs> so we were farmed out. And then sometimes she kind of got to the point where she started inviting young couples to come in and stay with us, just like young married couples. And they'd pay them. I don't know what they'd pay them. They'd pay them. And, um, you know, so it was weird. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd kind of had this pit in my stomach, you know, because it was like my mom and dad aren't here. It's that random couple that I don't even know. And those poor, I felt sorry for them. You know, they're thrown into a house. They're supposed to run it like they know how. They're young couples, and they've got instantly all these kids to take care of and figure out their schedules and how to cook for them and all that. So that was our normal routine. So to answer your question. Did that make you feel like I could imagine if I were the child of a general authority, that would be like, yes. Mormons do hard things, and my dad is one of Jesus' special representatives, and my parents are serving the church. And so, like, yes, we get to do a hard thing, and we're sacrificing as a family for the Lord's cause. Is that how you and your siblings thought of it? Or were there hard feelings no. or sadness? I, I'm like, wow, John, that's a really positive way to look at it. <laughs> you, that'd I, be, you'd be that way, right, Tyler? Absolutely. <laughs> 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 well, I think my older brother saw it as an opportunity to have parties. Oh, you know? really? Yeah. Um, but he, I mean, he didn't, he was a good kid. He never did anything bad, but he would just have friends over, you know, more often than normal. I was, I held a little resentment because I felt like, you know, I'm kind of an orphan half the time and I'm farmed out. Like, I felt like the church talks about families, family, 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 how important the family is, but. We were being neglected. But you felt that at the time. Yeah. You're not projecting back. No. At I felt time, it at the time. You're like, my family's neglecting me. Yeah. I felt I felt like, I guess I'm chopped liver. They don't, they'll just farm me out so they can go travel, 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 travel. And they'd come home with all these gifts where, you know, they, they toys and stuff that they'd bought in Germany or Japan or wherever they were. <laughs> and that was supposed to make it okay. You know, I just felt like something was backward. Back then, I was angry about mm-hmm. it. I really was. I, like I said, I woke up in the morning with my, a pit in my stomach. I felt like, you know, where's my mom? Where, you know, I don't, my mom's not here. And when I got, went to bed at night, I was sad. I would cry because I wanted my parents there. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I, feel, I feel kind of bratty being upset about that because I know there are people with worse experiences. Okay. I know there's always worse. But for me at the time, that was really hard. It was hard mm, for me. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm over it, but yeah. So um, 
when so the but they would be home at three month stretches, is yeah, that what you said? But but my dad would be gone. My oh, mom he'd would be, be gone. Okay. But he'd be at He was gone, gone, gone. He would be home Church headquarters, like traveling just around Utah. Traveling around yeah, traveling around Utah or Arizona or California or you know, the western states. He traveled a lot. Okay, so during those three months where your mom was home, right. he'd still be gone all the time. Right. Okay. So he'd be home usually on a Monday night. If the, if he was in town, he'd be home on Monday night. That was our sacred family home evening night. And so we would have it. Would Whenever he teach? He was would gone. your mom teach? No, my dad taught. He always taught. Uh huh. He loved it. Was it very patriarchal? Mm hmm. And so, what's it like to have this church celebrity guy who's charismatic and probably well informed giving these dazzling family <laughs> evenings? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Was it. I, we all put up with it. <laughs> it was kind of like, here we go, you know. And we'd be fighting and stuff, and it would frustrate my mom and dad. And they'd be like, can't we just have quiet for one hour? And, you know, <laughs> I just got to, you know. So he'd try to, and he'd have, he'd have the visual aids ready and everything. I mean, he, he went with the, the handbook. There was a family home evening handbook. And he would go through those lessons and teach them. And then, you know, we'd have the the song and then my mom would have a treat afterwards and so I mean there were perks to it but and he would do the morning scripture at six the whole if he was ever in town we had to get up and do the scripture study my mom would try she'd try to do it she wasn't as good at it as my dad she wasn't as motivated he just really wanted to do everything right he really did and like Sunday Sabbath observance, absolutely. Was it you can't? Was it that strict where you can't change out of your church clothes all day? No, or wasn't that strict? No, because we didn't have the cultural background. Because my parents were not members, you know, they were converts, so they didn't know all those cultural rules at all. They only knew, you know, you're not supposed to go out and buy things. You're not supposed to go swimming. Um, there were certain things that we would never do. But once in a while, we'd go out to eat. Until I think it was President Kimball really locked down on that later. But at first, we would go out to eat sometimes on Sunday. We, um, we could watch TV. My dad watched sports. But we were in our comfy clothes. Yeah. Um, like face cards, were they prohibited? Yeah, we didn't play face cards. What about popular music? Were you allowed to play rock music? Yeah. My dad was pretty open about that. If it was blatantly satanic or something, no. But, you know, he was too busy to notice. He really didn't notice what we were playing. Um, and he had his own music that he would blast up in his room, like Andy Williams and Glenn Campbell and <laughs> just the old crooners, you know. Yeah. He, Perry Como, uh, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> yeah, and he sang, too. He had a really nice singing voice, so he would sing at the top of his lungs all, all around the house in his garments. <laughs> yeah. I just got a visual. That was funny. Of him yeah. walking around yeah. in his garments singing. singing. Yeah. <laughs> what song? <laughs> lots of lots of Glenn Campbell. <laughs> like by the time I get to Phoenix and uh, I don't know, Moon River was another favorite. <laughs> With his garments? Yeah. I'm trying Just... to imagine Harmon Rector Jr. <laughs> singing Moon River in his garments. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and another thing about my dad that might be kind of interesting is he played racquetball and he was really good. Really good. He could whoop anybody and uh, so he would have a regular like he played every morning at the Deseret Gym mm -hmm. racquetball and so <clears throat> he would put on these really short shorts <laughs> with his temple coat over the top his white temple coat what's a temple coat well like temple suit oh, okay. like when you're in the when you're officiating oh, in the oh, temple oh, those guys wear a white yeah, suit coat yeah <laughs> so because he would go directly from the gym to the temple so he would wear, it was so weird. He would wear that out the door. Wait, his gym clothes. Gym shorts with the temple. And I'd see him. Sometimes I'd be at the store and I'd, he'd show up at the grocery store dressed like that. And I'd be like, Dad, put some pants on. But he just, he didn't care about that kind of stuff. He would just, because he didn't know the rules. And he didn't care about the rules. Yeah. So. Well, he cared about some rules. Some rules. But he didn't care about the cultural rules. Oh, okay. So, like, if somebody said this, you know, here are the, here are the rules. These are the commandments. He would follow those to the T. But if it was something subjective, like people, you know, they don't change out of their church clothes or something like that, he wouldn't have known that. Okay. Okay. So, what, what we didn't have caffeine in the no, house. No, no coke. No. No caffeinated beverages. Nothing. 
Um, not even chocolate. He b- didn't believe in chocolate. Okay. My mom believed in chocolate, <laughs> <laughs> but not my dad. So you don't believe in chocolate? No, you don't believe in chocolate. Where I don't know. That? He would he would eat Snicker bars. That was kind of his secret, though. It was in the freezer. Kept him in the freezer in a little bag of Snickers, and he would pull those out and eat those frozen. But that he would never like chocolate. He felt like was kind of. I don't know, kind of bad because it had caffeine. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has their dirty little secret. Right? The Snickers bars were his, so that's about as bad as it got. But he, um, you know, he did have, so I was going to say about the, about the Deseret Gym and the, and the um, racquetball, he got really good, so he would challenge people. Everywhere he traveled, he would kind have. like Joseph Smith challenging people to leg wrestle yes. or whatever. Yeah. He would have racquetball, um, <laughs> like, matches everywhere he was and like the best of the best athletes in the area would would be there all dressed up ready to play because they my dad was legendary that nobody could beat him he would give him a 20 point lead and still beat him he was <laughs> that good. A 21 right yeah so it was his serve you know it, it was the serve was right in the corner and it would just drop dead and you couldn't return it so like is he an alpha he's kind of an alpha male it sounds like oh definitely and a competitor there's no worse fan I mean, worse, because he's right in your face. He's, yeah, he loved BYU sports. I mean, he was a very aggressive sports fan. So, yeah, there, I mean, okay, so many good things about my dad. They were great. Okay, so any other things about family culture in your middle and high school years that you want to mention, just to paint that picture? We got church okay. study prayer. Yeah. No caffeine. Right. You know, that kind of stuff. Parents, dad gone, mom gone. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Strict, like, was it gospel about love? Was it about appearance? Was it about discipline? Mm-hmm. Was it harsh? You know, was he? Yeah, he was a disciplinarian and very, um, I mean, a loving guy, too. But he had this sort of, um, he was a patriarch of the home. And, like, I told this story on the other podcast, but it bears repeating. He would sit down at the table, and my mom would serve him, and she would she would just kind of stand aside. She wouldn't sit down at the table and eat when he was sitting there. She would be serving him. So he'd say, I need a little bit of jam. (laughs) And she'd run and get it. Water's empty. She'd refill that. I need a little salt. I mean, she was just just like a waitress. And then when when he was finally starting to, you know, slow down, she would sit down and finally start to eat. That was just the way it was. And that's probably as much of an American thing as a a, a Mormon thing. Right. The patriarchal. I mean, America's patriarchal. And seventies were probably way more chauvinistic Very than they much. are now. And yeah, so in a lot of ways he was chauvinistic. Mm-hmm. Um, like he would tell me, "Little girls are meant to be seen and not heard," because mm. he didn't like my mouth. Mm. I was a little bit. Um, he told me a bunch of times that I was the biggest challenge he had had, even though Linda had got. Oops. One of my sisters had gotten pregnant. <laughs> um, I was the challenge because I would back talk. I would. I would challenge him on mm. things. Not sassy, but like, I don't think that's right. <clears throat> I don't agree with that. You know, whatever. And that. Ooh. That's bold. Oh, he did not like that. I was told I was impudent probably a thousand times. Mm. And he would tell me, you know, you're not supposed to talk back. And we didn't say it like that. It was angry. We had a lot of fights, my dad and I. Mm-hmm. Head to head fights. Mm. Um, I remember one time I went and saw, I was probably, I was in junior high. And I went and saw Jesus Christ Superstar while he was on the road. I Which didn't, was this Broadway musical where where Jesus and all his apostles are hippies, right? Right. And are they riding? Are they on roller skates? No, but but it's just like something like that. I, yeah, I don't even it's remember just, the it's movie. Like, it's basically Woodstock crashes into the the Last Supper, <laughs> and all of Jesus and, and his apostles and are super it. hippies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So my dad's out. I didn't know he was campaigning against this movie all over the United States. I had no idea. He didn't bother to mention that he to you. He didn't tell me. Yeah, just the other kids, not his own kids, right? So I had no idea. So I go with my friends. They're all, hey, let's go to the movie. So I went, come home, and my mom's like, what movie did you see? And I told her. And then she looked at me like, oh, you better. And then so my dad, oh, I think Tyler. So... The mic? Okay. Yeah. So then my dad comes home, walks through the door, and my mom grabs him and says, do you know what your daughter just went, just did? 
she went and saw Jesus Christ Superstar. And he came in the kitchen. I was sitting on the bench. There was like a bench on one side of the table and chairs on the other. I was sitting on the bench and he came over and jerked me off the bench onto the floor and proceeded to kick me all over the kitchen, which I had seen him do to my brother. Literally kick you. Kicking. Yeah. Screaming at me. His nostrils flared, his teeth bared, yelling at me and saying, do you have any idea what I've just been doing? I've been all over this country telling people not to go see that movie. Mm. And I said, well, you didn't tell me. You know, and that made him more angry. So we would have, I mean, that was one of probably the most memorable experiences of what I considered to be abusive. Um, he was very verbally abusive, but that was one of the worst times I remember him being physical with me. He was physical with my brothers a lot. But then I look back and those were part of the times because he, he grew up on a farm uh, in the Midwest, and his dad beat him. So it was kind of, ex it was just part of the culture in his mind. So he didn't see anything wrong with that. I got spanked a lot. I got swatted with a fly swatter on bare legs, bare butt, you know, a lot of that kind of thing. And that was just the norm for my family. I never thought anything of it really until later when I was raising my own kids and there was a lot of talk about abuse, you know, child abuse. And I was, I was like, wow, I guess I was kind of ab abused in my home. So, um, and I, I just want to kind of speak about intent here. First of all, I, I didn't know anything about your story, uh, going into this interview. Right. And I, um, it's just not my style to like want to get dirt. I, I want truth. I want yeah. good and bad. And right. so, uh, you know, so you're just telling your real story and I'm noticing that there's a lot of painful stuff. Yeah. But it is just the truth. Like I'm not, I'm not angry at my dad for that because that was for him. That was how you raised kids. He was raised in a completely different culture. His dad beat him with a belt. You know, I knew that cause he told me stories about it. So for me to get kicked around the kitchen floor was kind of, in my mind, it was like, well, I probably deserved it. And I didn't, like I said, I'd been spanked my whole life. I didn't think it was awful. And I didn't hate my dad for that. I loved my dad. I admired my dad. I later in life realized that I had some issues that I needed to deal with about him. And I dealt with him, I mean, dealt with them face to face with my dad as he, when he got older. But at the time, I didn't feel like I was being abused. It was just normal for me. And some of that's cultural. Yeah. I mean, I, it was common for those of us gr growing up in the seventies or eighties to be spanked or yeah. grabbed or jerked, not kicked. Right. I, I, don't, I was never kicked. Yeah. So I'm, that's, yeah. I'm, that's hard. Um, uh, so um, I don't want to, I want to have you just share any other, so w was there ever like parents sit children down and say, listen, we're general, you know, I'm a general authority. We're leaders in the church. This family needs to behave. This family needs to be examples. Yes. Was it ever that explicit or was it more just whenever someone made a mistake that came up? You know, or, yeah. or was it just unsaid? Like, how do you, how do you, how does that get communicated? I think there were times he would talk about the name, his name, and that we needed to respect that name and be examples. And so he would say, you know, when you're out in public, everybody's watching you. The things that you do, things you say, that reflects on our name. And you need to respect our name. Our name is, is, you know, it's, it's all you've got. And so, and he would say, so w behave the way that you want people to remember you as, you know, I remember the pressure feeling like I can't do or act like my friends were doing, you know, what they were doing because people were watching me. My mom would remind me that, you know, she'd say, you know, remember, you know, people are watching you. Be careful what you, be careful what you say and do. Um, so I felt like people were, you know, kind of watching my behavior because it reflected on them. And what's that like as a teen in Salt Lake City in the 70s to feel like everybody's watching you yeah. and like there's this 
extra expectation and pressure. There's some pressure there. And I think I did feel like uh, maybe it wasn't fair. Like I wanted to be just me. I didn't want to have to live up to someone else's expectations. And I've found that that's kind of a theme in my life. Expectations are, they like, there's something deep down inside that just makes me crazy about the idea that someone expects something of me. Um, and I think it must have started back then. And then when my dad got called, he got called to be a mission president again in San Diego when I was um, just finishing my sophomore year. Of at high East. school. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So I had to go to San Diego and go to finish my junior and my senior year, which was really hard because on one hand, I was excited to go to California because, you know, the beach and the sun and you think, wow, surfer boys, <laughs> you know, everybody was like, wow, you get to go live in San Diego. Wow. But on the other hand, it was, you know, you're going in cold. You don't know anybody. You're going into a high school. Nobody knows you. you uh, it was just it was scary, but it was also exciting. So I did. I went and um, once again, my dad was miss mission president. So it's like, hey, you know, you need to make sure that you set an example for everybody that you come across. You're a missionary. You're an extension of your, your family, your parents. So you need to be a missionary. And so that means you have to behave really, you know, as best as you can. And so I really took that on. I took that on as a, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, spread the gospel in my life just by how I act. And I remember in school, you know, I never went to, I never drank. I never, I didn't do anything, you know, like that at all. But uh, I had some negative experiences with some people. Um, one of the church girls, one of the girls that I, during the summer when we moved into San Diego, uh, this girl said, hey, do you want to go to the beach with us? We go three times a week. You can come. And I was like, yeah, I'll go to the beach. Absolutely. So I started going to the beach with them, and she would tell me stories about, you know, the guys at school and who was popular and all this stuff. So when school started, there was a guy that she had had a crush on, and he started asking me out, which made her angry. And this is a Mormon girl, right? made her really angry, so she started to spread rumors around the school because nobody knew me. And one of the rumors she spread was that I was a lesbian. <laughs> so back then, this was 1977, it wasn't cool yet to be a lesbian. <laughs> so If it is. Right. Now, yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't then at all, and it was very kind of taboo. And so all the girls thought I was weird. All the guys, I don't know what the guys thought. They didn't seem to mind as much, but the girls <laughs> would not talk to me. Uh, so I, except for the lesbian girls. And then yeah. I got invited to do stuff with them. I didn't know, I had no idea that this rumor was being spread. So I get these girls calling me to come over to their house and hang out. And they're asking me to come roll around on the cushions with them on the floor. And then suddenly I realized this is what's happening, you know, and I said, hey, I, I like boys. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not going to do this, you know. And then someone in the school told me what she was doing. So there was, and also that I dealt, dealt drugs. So that was a really hard experience for me in San Diego when my dad was mission president. Um, I had a really rough two years. That was mm. really hard. Um, did any, did you or any of your siblings ever party or break the rules or drink yeah. or? Have yeah. sex or yeah. mess around with girls and boys. Well, my one sister. Okay, did, right, right. She got pregnant, and she was into. But that wasn't just a one-time fluke. I mean, she was like disobedient. Yeah, she was smoking pot. Or, she was drinking. Okay, she okay. was doing a lot of things. Okay. Um, and th that was older. What about this yeah. brother, the popular brother? Dan he was, said he was having parties. But. Yeah, I don't know. He may have. He may have done some alcohol back in the day. Like, I never really knew about it. Okay. He wasn't. Like, I never heard my parents yelling at him about that. Okay. Uh, later, I mean, a bunch of my family has left the church. So now, you know, people do a lot of things that we didn't do back then. When we were all home under the roof or, you know, close by, um, I didn't really have... My parents adopted a, a son from Samoa, and he was heavily into partying and alcohol and still is, and that's another story. Okay. But, yeah. Most of us were not. 